Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that He saves. Publish His glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things He does. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround Him. Strength and joy fill His dwelling. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory He deserves. Bring your offering and come into His presence. Worship the Lord in all His holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before Him. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tell all the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea and everything in it shout His praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God of our salvation. Gather and rescue us from among the nations, so we can thank your holy name and rejoice and praise you. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people shouted, Amen, and praised the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and happy Thanksgiving. Welcome to the first weekend of Advent. This is the part of the year where we sort of make the turn from fall to winter, and, and uh, celebrate with anticipation the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we still have some of the, the Thanksgiving fall decorations up. We got the, the Advent candles. There'll be more of those Christmas decorations to come. But one of the ways that we celebrate Advent together is with the candles and with some readings from the Old Testament that help us to uh, get that feeling of anticipation, that sense of what's next in the church year. And I always like to have some of our, our young people help me out with these candles. So some of the students in my catechism class are going to be assisting us with the, the readings during the month ahead. And so this week, Julia is going to help me out. We're going to read some familiar words from the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah, it says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress, in the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will honor galleries of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. Establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We are going to, uh, to sing next in anticipation of our Savior's birth, and I'll light the candles here. Thanks, Julia. We're going to begin worship today with um, a song that demonstrates a hope and a joy and a rejoicing before the thing happens. We're all looking forward to Christmas right now, and as we begin Advent, we begin preparing our hearts, we begin singing the songs that move our hearts towards 
um, that expectation of the Savior's birth. We also look back to a time when Israel longed for a Savior. And these lyrics express that, that expectation and hope. When we say, rejoice, rejoice, a, a Savior shall come to you. We rejoice even before it happens. Please stand as we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come. promise of God throughout the Old Testament that was that he would come. He had promised to come, and in Jesus Christ, he fulfilled that promise. And God came to us, Emmanuel, and then God comes to us in the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God to live in us. And so we are grateful for that presence. We have gathered in his name in order to worship him, celebrate his coming, in this season of Advent. And our God is with us, so may the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Take a moment now to greet one another as we have come gathering together in worship.
All right, everyone, join us with loud singing and clapping hands as we sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Amen. You know, um, Pastor Zach, when he welcomed you guys, this is such a weird uh, Sunday for us to lead worship and um, be in sync with the uh, times and seasons. And you see a little bit of Christmas and a little bit of Thanksgiving here. But I often tell people that Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's really, we're really looking at the same season. And we're really looking at the same sort of of providence, albeit maybe providence of different things. This one song that we're going to sing in just a moment ties it all together, I think, with the lyric, I sing for joy at the work of your hands. How many of you sat around a table of plenty this last week and looked at the, the spread on the table and joined hands and prayed together for all that God has provided us in that tangible world. You know, we look and we, we think about providence and all that God has uh, given us by his, by his grace and because of his love for us. And then we look to the Christmas season also and we see a different sort of providence. We're reminded that um, the indescribable gift of, of Jesus Christ, and for both things, we do sing for joy at the work of the hands of God. And so let's sing together right now, Shout to the Lord.
shout to the Lord. In the um, Belgic Confession, which is one of our three forms of unity, it says this about the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, not only from the time he assumed our nature, but from all eternity. As the following testimonies teach us when they are all taken together, Moses says that God created the world. And John says that all things were created through the word, which he calls God. The apostle says that God created the world through the Son. And he also says that God created all things through Jesus Christ. And so it must follow that the one who is called God, the one who is called the word, the one who is called the Son, the one who is called Jesus Christ, already existed before creating all things. Therefore, the prophet Micah says that Christ's origin is from ancient of days, and the apostle says that the Son has neither beginning of days nor end of life. And so then, he is true eternal God. Jesus Christ is true eternal God, the Almighty, whom we invoke, whom we worship, and whom we serve. Let's sing together, Behold Our God.
Amen. Behold our God. You may be seated. Thank you, Cadence and Karen and Michelle and Kim for singing. At this time, I'm going to ask all of the children who want to come up to Kids Church. Uh, this is uh, up through element for a uh, fifth grade or so. Come on up stage, and we're going to have our dismissal time. All right, kids. We are going to recite question and answer number one of the Heidelberg Catechism, and we'd like you to join us as we do that. Are you ready, Brooklyn? Yep. yep. Mariah? John? Benjamin? Maybe you guys have a good Thanksgiving? Yes. Good food? Good folks? A little bit of fun? Ready to go back to school? All right, let's get back on track here. What is your only comfort in life? and in death. You guys sing, say this with me, okay? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. All right, folks, go up and listen to your teacher with your whole hearts. Wholehearted participation in children's worship is what we pray for wholehearted participation in your life of worship. Everyone, we're hoping for that as well. Uh, let's go through some ministry news, taking a look at the bulletin and maybe a couple things that aren't on there. Um, last week, we had our final collection day for Operation Christmas Child, and so if you didn't bring your box in last week, it's too late. No, we would not do that. We also opened up today as a possible coll uh, collection day for those boxes also. So if you have it with you, please leave it so that we can get it out to those, uh, those kids around the world. It goes to a warehouse packing center, and it's, um, all the boxes are prayed over, and they are put on different um, planes and boats, and they go all over the world. And so thank you for participating in that during the season. Now, here's the big question. What if you didn't bring it today? And you still, how, I wonder if any of you guys have some boxes that you haven't even like assembled yet. They're just like flat boxes that are sitting there. Or I wonder if you're just so busy and you didn't get a chance to do it and you still want to do it. Is there any way that Bell One would give you another chance to drop those boxes off? I think we better, right? Right? We're not playing, this isn't like some rule game or something like that. And so Karen, one of our deacons who's coordinating this process, whole process, um, is giving us one more Sunday to bring in the boxes. So if you didn't bring them in already, please bring them either to family night this Wednesday, I'll talk to you about that in a little bit later, or bring them next Sunday. But, you know, bring the boxes because um, each of those boxes, they reach a kid. We reach a kid with the good news of Jesus Christ and we just want to be able to be a part of it, right? God's going to get his word out. The gospel's going to go out. We just want you to be a part of it. And so that's what Operation Christmas Child is about. And so Karen and the deacons, thank you for helping us to be able to participate in such a project. As we've mentioned, uh, you saw the candles and you heard O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and we're starting to make that turn from Thanksgiving to Advent. And uh, one of the things that we're doing on your way in Many of you, or all of you, should have received a button here that says, um, Jesus, he came for you. Is that a good word? That's a good word, and we want you to pin it right there on your shirt. And so you don't have to just wear it to church. It's not a uniform. It's an opportunity for you to be able to 
uh, share the message of Jesus Christ during this Advent season leading up to Christmas. And so if anybody asks you about it, you can tell them where you got it from, and they can come back next week and they can get one, or we will have extra as the weeks go on to be able to help you be able to share Christ with others during this season. Uh, this week on Tuesday at 1.30, Quilts of Valor um, is awarding quilts to 12 veterans that are in our community. Last week we had about 10. We had Marines. We had this lady who was a Vietnam nurse. She was a lieutenant. And uh, these people, they just come in and they are so um, grateful for the support that they get. And they give these wonderful testimonies and stories about their um, their work in the military, and we just want to be able to thank them along with Quilts of Valor. So if you want to come by and be a part of that celebration, that ceremony, you can join us in the social hall at 1.30. On Wednesday, the cadets are hosting the family night dinner, and we have quite a dinner planned for you. Um, you just, I tell you what, on Wednesday at 6 p.m., come to family night and come hungry come ready to eat. I know I'm already a part of the process. It's a little bit of a surprise menu, but um, I will tell you this, it involves a little bit of charcoal. So join us for family night at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, as well as gems and cadets and adult Bible study to follow the dinner. Um, next Saturday morning, we are going to be decorating the church. All of these fall colors will be gone, and then all of the Christmas colors will be here, so please, um, we're going to be reaching out to everyone because we know that many hands make light work, and so we are asking you to join us on Saturday morning to put up some trees, to put up the trimmings, and to make this place look like a welcome place for the Christmas season next week. Um, other than that, I will leave the rest of the announcements to Pastor Zach, and have a great rest of the service. Thank you, Pastor Aaron. Um, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was great. Yeah. Yep. People, What'd you guys have? You know what? We uh, opened up our turkey and discovered it was rancid. So turkey didn't, didn't have turkey. Didn't work out. What was the plan B? There was also a ham in the fridge, and it was pretty good. The ham was delicious. So okay. All right. Count your blessings, do. right? Count your blessings. Yep. All right. Listen, thankful for plan B that worked. So you can ask Jane more about that if you want to know. <laughs> We had an interesting Thanksgiving morning. Well, it is good to be with you. Uh, welcome, and especially a welcome to those of you who may be visiting this morning. We are glad you're here as we um, celebrate Thanksgiving and anticipate the birth of Christ. This is a great time of the year to be together in church. A couple other things I want to mention. One is that there is a congregational meeting coming up. It's our uh, budget meeting. Every December, we have a, a Monday night meeting to talk about that and vote on that. So, You'll also find there's absentee ballots for that, um, and if you have any questions, you can talk to a deacon. There was also a, a collection for Thanksgiving. Uh, there was, we had these around for a while, and we did collect those on Thanksgiving, but if you have one, you can drop it into the plate as it goes by. And if you want to give next week, that's fine too. There's lots of wonderful causes to give towards on the list here, and you can, you can give generously that way. Uh, a couple other things. One is that there is no catechism this particular Sunday. We will pick it up again next week. And we also have a few things for prayer. We want to lift up uh, a few people in particular. One is uh, George Brink, who has been dealing with a very painful case of shingles for the last week or two. And he asked for prayer, and he's feeling a lot of pain from, from that particular uh, case of shingles. So we want to lift him up. We also want to pray for John Luth, who was admitted to the hospital yesterday. He had some kidney and lung ailments along with a uh, case of COVID, and so that combination really wiped out his strength, and he needed to go to the hospital. He was admitted, so we uh, should keep him in prayer. He's very tired for his recovery, but also for Carolyn, who is, uh, of course, uh, concerned about him from home. So let's lift up John and Carolyn Luth this week as well. And join our hearts together as we pray to our Heavenly Father. O oh Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, we come to you in this spirit of celebration this week as we uh, have given thanks during the Thanksgiving holiday and been with our family and friends. We're so grateful for so, all the things that you've given to us. Lord, we come to worship this morning in a spirit of gratitude as 
The psalmist says, giving us words of gratitude, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. And let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Lord, that is what we have done this morning as we sang our praises to you, joining our voices and hearts as one, seeking you, praising your holy name, desiring that you would be glorified above all, all other powers in this world. For you are our creator, redeemer, sustainer, the one who promises to make all things new at the return of Christ. And so, Lord, we, we give you greatest honor thanks and glory for all that you have done. And Lord, even as we rejoice and give you thanks for all that you are and all that you've done, we also turn with this season of the year from thanksgiving to Advent, from deep gratitude to joyful anticipation about the baby born in Bethlehem, about this baby who would grow up to save his people from their sins. And Lord, we do pray for your pardon, for we are sinners we are people who have broken your commands, who have broken faith with you and others in relationship, who have neglected things we should have done and seek your pardon. Lord, we need your mercy, and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask it in Jesus' name. Lord, we also pray for those who are in need, those who are struggling today. Lord, we lift up George Brink before you, asking on, uh, for him uh, relief, from the, the itchiness and pain of this case of shingles, asking that you'd provide him with strength and healing today and in the week ahead. Lord, we also pray for John Luth in the hospital with uh, several serious ailments together, asking for a good recovery and for good care in the hospital, for help with his kidneys and his lungs. Lord, we ask your blessing on others who face challenges for Joanne and Bob Rekirk, for Tom Denowden, for Lene Cause's daughter, for Nelvina, and for many others, Lord, people who are on our hearts. Lord, we name them from our hearts and in our thoughts to you in this prayer, praying for your help and blessing in their lives. God, in addition to these prayers for healing, we also ask that for all these who are on our hearts and who we have named, that through these trials, you would not just strengthen their bodies, but that you would also strengthen their faith, that you would renew hope, that your spirit would communicate the depths of your love so that even through these trials and difficulties, they would draw nearer to you, ever nearer to Jesus Christ. Lord, we do pray that as people uh, hear about Jesus, they would draw nearer, that each of us would draw nearer. We pray for your blessing on our ministries that through them, people at this church and in our city would know Christ more. We pray for your blessing on family night and coffee break and here in worship, here in all the activities that happen here at this church, that people would know Christ more and more. And we pray too, Lord, that in the gifts that we give next during our offering, those gifts would be a blessing that your kingdom would be extended. And we pray all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our deacons will receive our offerings.
So the, uh, the sermon series in this uh, part of the year, as we make the turn into Advent, is going to be uh, one called Meeting Jesus. And all the stories that we hear from the Gospels will be about someone who met Jesus. There's lots of stories like that in the Gospels. Meeting Jesus for the first time, and what's that like? What does Jesus have to say to them? How does that interaction go? And what do we learn? Because all of us um, have at one point met Jesus and then continue to be in relationship with Jesus. These are uh, great stories for us in this time of the year. So the person who met Jesus in our particular story this morning is Nathaniel. So we're going to read about that in just a moment. Let's ask God's blessing as we hear his word. Our Heavenly Father, uh, each one of us has met Jesus in your word and through your very presence in our lives, and we're so thankful for that. Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk with you, that having heard you say, follow me, we would uh, follow in your steps. We know, Lord, that you walk with us, that you uh, take us by the hand. We pray for your blessing as we hear this word and how Nathaniel met Jesus, and that it would uh, be fruitful for us in our own relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the the story of Philip and Nathanael and Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. I think he'd been in the region of Judea at that point. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth! Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And then he added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is God's word for us this morning. Compton? Could anything good come from Compton? Some of us might say that if we heard this passage and then wondered, what would that be like here In our part of the city, if I was talking about western Michigan, I might say something like Benton Harbor. Can anything good come from Benton Harbor? I had a reputation when I was growing up. But I wonder if some people living in our area might also say Bellflower. Can anything good come from Bellflower? Some people might say that. I keep seeing on the news these car chases end at Bellflower Boulevard. You might start to wonder what is going on in Bellflower. It's kind of a strange thing. And of course, the point of this passage is that we shouldn't talk this way. Nathaniel was all wrong when he said Nazareth. And so maybe that's a lesson for us right here at the start. Now, Nathaniel comes uh, and he hears about Jesus. He interacts with Jesus. He meets Jesus. And he realizes quickly that his expectations were wrong. That what he thought about, his, about Jesus being from Nazareth, that, that, was, that his expectations were way too low. And so Jesus exceeded his expectations. But in his interaction with Jesus, he also discovers that his expectations were way too far off as well. That Jesus changes Nathaniel's expectations to be something different. So as Nathaniel meets Jesus, he discovers that his expectations were too low, and he discovers that his expectations were also 
way off. They should be more. They should be different. That's what he discovers in this conversation. That's what we're going to discover as we listen in on their interaction. Now, the story begins with Philip. Philip, who was, must have been a friend of Nathaniel, who followed Jesus and then went to Nathaniel and said, you got to hear, you got to know about this guy, Jesus. We found the one. He's it. Now, there's several nice little applications here about bearing witness, about evangelism, just from this little interaction from Philip to Nathaniel. Several things that are a useful application for evangelism right from the start of this passage. One is, is about just the way that Philip comes to Nathaniel to tell him about Jesus, that there is an enthusiasm, there is an urgency about this from Philip to Nathaniel. And it's true that how you say something and the tone of your voice, the urgency of your words, communicates a lot beyond just the content of what you're saying, right? That when we tell people about Jesus, the enthusiasm, urgency, and tone of our voice will tell them almost as much about Jesus as the words that we speak. This is important for us when we bear witness. How does the enthusiasm of your voice and the urgency of your life communicate about Jesus as you share your faith, as you bear witness to him. That's the first thing. The other thing that comes through as Philip speaks to Nathaniel is the way that he connects Jesus to Scripture. He connects Jesus to Scripture saying that Jesus is the one who filled every, fulfilled everything Moses said. He fulfilled everything the prophets said. Now, a couple weeks ago, when uh, I talked about Psalm 40, we took note that David said to God, hollow out my ears, chisel out my ears, so that your word can get deep into my heart, so that it's in the heart and that he wants to do God's will. And that the way the word gets into our heart is through our ears. We hear the word. And it's true that in Evangelism, one of the most important tools or things that we have to work with is the Word of God. That the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God in more significant ways than anything else. The Word of God is, is so important as we bear witness to Jesus, to connect Him to it, to, to use God's Word to tell people about Jesus. The Holy Spirit uses that to grab a hold of people, to get it in their heart, to chisel out their ears and to have conviction about Jesus from hearing God's word. So that's another thing that Philip does. Well, Nathaniel is a bit skeptical. He has this skeptical attitude. So finally, Philip simply says, come and see. He makes an invitation. And that's important too, that after bearing witness to make an invitation, come and see. Do take another step. Join with God's people. Come and meet Jesus. Take another step. Now, it's enough that Nathaniel says, okay. He goes with Philip and he meets Jesus. Now, that attitude that Nathaniel has, I guess, is not too surprising. Nathaniel is from the next town over in Galilee. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And five miles to the north, over the hill, is another very small town of Cana. Cana is where Nathaniel grew up. That's his hometown. So they're really not that far apart, five miles apart. And sometimes small towns can have rivalries like this, right? And this is not that unusual then or now for towns to have rivalries with each other and have, an, have sort of an attitude about the next town over that's not entirely accurate simply because you grew up in the, the rival town. It's typical. So Nathaniel had this attitude. Nonetheless, he comes and sees. But it's not that surprising that he had that attitude because he's not the only one that has that kind of attitude about Nazareth. Because even throughout the Gospels, other people hear where Jesus is from and they're kind of skeptical, too, like the religious leaders in Jerusalem. 
shake their heads sometimes and say, but we didn't, but the Messiah is not supposed to come from Galilee. Jesus is from Nazareth. How can this be? They didn't didn't understand that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They just figured that nothing good could come from Galilee or Nazareth. And so the religious leaders, many of them, most of them, never came around. They never came to receive Jesus the way they should, the way Nathaniel even does here in this passage. And it's not that unusual even today for people to take a skeptical attitude towards Christ, towards Christianity. But it's important for them to hear the witness that we have, like Philip did, and for us to make the invitation for them to come and meet Jesus. Come and see, says Philip, and that is what Nathaniel does. So let's now switch and talk about Nathaniel's interaction with Jesus. Jesus engages Nathaniel with some gentle rebukes. He does so a couple times. First, Nathaniel swings one way. He's kind of skeptical, and Jesus corrects that skepticism, and then he swings the other way, and he has this sort of emotional outburst about Jesus, and Jesus has to sort of slow him down on that side, too. He seems to be this kind of person who swings like a pendulum. Well, the first little rebuke, gentle rebuke, is like a joke, a little pun about one of their ancient ancestors, and it reveals Jesus' insight into Nathanael. In verse 47, Jesus says to Nathanael as he walks up, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, you may remember that the man whose name was changed to Israel was born with the name Jacob. And the meaning of the name Jacob was deceit, trickster. Jacob was a deceiver. So the joke here is that Jesus is saying to Nathanael, hey, here's an Israelite, not a Jacob. Here's a straight talker, not a deceiver. Here's a guy who tells you just what he thinks. He doesn't hide it with some tricks. Here's an Israel, not a Jacob. Now, Nathaniel's taken aback. He's like, how do you know me? Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, it's hard to say exactly what the fig tree has to do with anything in particular, but whatever it was, Nathaniel must have known and was shocked that Jesus already knows all about him. So Jesus knew that he was a straight talker even before he started to talk. Jesus knew that he was under the fig tree before he even got to talk to Jesus. Jesus probably knew what he already, this is when he realizes, like, what else does Jesus know? Does he know what I said about Nazareth? This could be kind of an awkward conversation, right? I mean, if this guy knows everything about me, he knows what I had just said about his hometown. And what if there was a person, what if you met a person who knew all your opinions about them before you spoke to them? That would probably feel a little bit awkward, right? To stand completely transparent before somebody else, maybe somebody you had already insulted, and now you're going to talk to this person who can peer into your thoughts, who knows your heart, who, who has all this knowledge. That would be kind of a strange situation. That's, how, that's the situation that Nathaniel finds himself. But what's important is not, not as much that Nathaniel knew or that Jesus knew everything about Nathaniel. What's important is also that Jesus loved Nathaniel. Nathaniel is transparent to Jesus, but Nathaniel is also loved by Jesus. He could see all the way into his heart, and he cared about him. He's calling him to be a disciple. He gave his life for him at the cross. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Now, all of us do long to be affirmed, loved by somebody who really matters, to be cared about by someone with real authority. I mean, we strive for this in all sorts of ways. I mean, some people try to to prove that they deserve affirmation by proving it to their peers because they made it in life. They were successful. They worked hard. And so they should be affirmed and and even loved, respected, because they did it. Other people try to prove themselves to their parents by fulfilling their expectations for their parents or getting good grades or making it in life. 
Other people try to get affirmation on social media with likes and shares and comments or to get on TV or win a com competition. I had a friend once years and years ago who said that just to, for his parents to know that he had made it in life, he wanted his name on the credits to a TV show sometime in some kind of way. Like for some reason that was important to him about making it in life. That his parents could see that he had somehow made something in his life if he got on the credits to some TV show. And he didn't even hardly care which one it was. It just expressed a deep yearning from him and that all of us have to be affirmed by someone who matters face to face to know that you are accepted, that you are loved, and that we matter. And that's what Jesus does to each one of us. Jesus knows all about you. You are transparent to Jesus. But Jesus also loves you more than anyone ever will, giving his life for you. We all long for that face-to-face -face affirmation. In fact, that's what happens in the parting blessing. In the words that, uh, I, that the, the minister often gives at the end of the service, that God gives for blessing. May the Lord's face shine on you. It speaks to that deep desire we have to be affirmed and loved by someone who matters. And God says, you matter. My face shines on you with care. So Jesus is turning this skeptic into a believer. And Nathaniel says to Jesus, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. First he swung too far one way in skepticism. Now he swung all the other way in this outburst. So now Jesus begins to take this new believer and, and move him into a place of deeper faith. One that's not swinging between skepticism and emotion. Because Jesus says, you're going to see greater things than this. Stick around. Keep thinking, Nathaniel. You're going to see great, greater things than this. And he gets serious. He says in verse 51, truly I tell you. That's what Jesus says when he says something serious. The first thing he said about Israel and deceit was sort of a pun, a little joke. It got Nathaniel's attention. But the second thing he says about heaven opened and angels ascending and descending is far more substantial. It's far greater. What does it mean? Jesus says that he is the son of man. What does that mean? Now, there are a bunch of titles that uh, come up in this passage. The son of man, king of Israel, son of God, rabbi, son of Joseph, Jesus of Nazareth. Lots of titles, lots of things in this passage thrown around. And the word son of man is kind of ambiguous. Really, the only person who ever uses this title is Jesus when he's talking about himself. Like Nobody else uses this one. Sometimes when Jesus uses it, he seems to be using it just simply to refer to himself as, an, as a human being. That he's a man too, fully human. Other times, Jesus uses it in order to allude to a prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel sees a man who looks like a son of man on, on the clouds of heaven, entering the presence of the Ancient of Days and to receive all rule and authority. And Jesus is saying, I'm that guy too. But one of the reasons Jesus used this title is because nobody else did. It's kind of ambiguous, which means that he's kind of got it all to himself. And that means that it didn't have a lot of preconceived notions in it. It had some due to the Daniel 7 chapter. That's important. But not nearly as much as many of the other titles that were more typical. What it means is that Jesus can fill this title, Son of Man, with the content that he wants it to have. And not with the associations that all these other titles had. Like that title, King of Israel. That was kind of a dangerous title to take in those days. I mean, people who went around in those days taking the title King of Israel were quickly disposed of by the Romans, who didn't like that one so well. It's, taking that title is like taking a, a live firearm or a grenade with a loose pin in it. People didn't think about those titles the way they should either. When people heard titles like King of Israel, they didn't think he will save us from our sins. They thought instead he will save us from the Romans. Jesus didn't come for that. 
Those titles were too loaded with politics, the politics of ancient Israel. That's local politics. Jesus is interested in politics, but it's a much different politics. Jesus was interested in a politics that was way, way bigger than anything they imagined. Their expectations were way too low. Jesus raises their expectations. Jesus was interested in in an eternal politics, a cosmic politics that would apply to the whole universe. He wasn't interested in a politics that applied just to one nation or one time and place. Jesus was interested in a politics that would apply to all nations in all times and places. The Great Commission is for the whole world. The Church of Christ is made up of people from every tribe and tongue, people and nation. And so the content of the culture he was living in was not something he wanted to define who he was. It was his was too big. He didn't come just to be the king of Israel. He came to be the king of kings. He told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. So there's a lot of substance that he intends to show in these greater things to Nathaniel and everyone else who would follow him. I mean, he began his interaction with Nathaniel with like a pun, a little joke. But he's, he continues to talk about some serious stuff, engaging both the heart and mind. Jesus wants Nathaniel to think and to keep thinking because there's so much more. That's what uh, Pastor Tim Keller says about this passage and about his own spiritual journey when he writes about this particular story. There's an interview I read just this week about uh, Keller when he talks about his uh, coming to Christ, and it parallels a little bit what is happening here with Nathaniel. So I thought I'd share just a little bit of it, Nathaniel swinging from skepticism to belief, trying to engage both his mind and his heart. And Keller says that when he became a Christian, he says, I took a rational path, I would say, towards being a Christian. He says, I'm the kind of person, who I don't trust my feelings. If I was going to embrace Christianity fully, I wanted to really believe that it was intellectually credible. I was afraid that I was going to come up with some faith that just met my emotional needs and it wasn't really real. It would crumble. I was afraid it would crumble later in life if I started getting older and reading more books. I didn't want something that would crumble when I got older. But he says that on the other hand, I really did need something to help me sift my inner feelings, to find out who I was. And which of these inner feelings is me? Which of these is not? And so that something turned out to be the Christian faith. And he converted to Christianity his sophomore year at college. So for Keller, faith involved the convergence of mind and heart. He says, I tend to think a fully formed Christian is somebody who finds Christianity both rationally and intellectually credible, but also emotionally true and satisfying. And so, in a different place writing about this, Keller reflects on the passage about Nathaniel and says, Jesus isn't against people thinking. Jesus thinks they should do a lot more thinking. He gently rebukes Nathaniel here saying, there's so much more. Your expectations were too low. Come and see. There's something that is emotionally satisfying in Christian faith. There is something that is intellectually satisfying. It's for heart and mind together. Don't get too skeptical, Nathaniel. Use your mind. Don't get too emotional, Nathaniel. Learn the way your heart works. All of that comes in relationship to Jesus Christ. Jesus is more and different from what we could imagine. Now, Jesus goes back to the Jacob story one more time to blow up all of Nathaniel's expectations that he had coming into his encounter meeting Jesus. Now, you remember the Jacob story, that Jacob was this deceiver, and he stole his brother's birthright and inheritance, and his brother Esau was mad, said, I'm going to kill that brother of mine. So, Jacob went on the run. Jacob was on the run, and he was in a remote place, and he laid down to sleep in a field. He put a rock under his head, and in the night he had a dream. He saw a stairway that went from earth to heaven with angels ascending and descending. And when he woke up, having heard the promises of God, that God would be with him, God renewed the promises he'd made to Abraham to him, he woke up and said, this must be the house of God. And he named the place Bethel. Bethel meaning house of God. 
And now Jesus is saying that those same things are true about him. He, Jesus is claiming this story about Bethel for himself. Jesus is saying that he is the one on whom angels ascend and descend. Jesus is saying that he is the one who unites heaven and earth. And Nathaniel's going to see greater things because, in fact, Jesus is the greater thing. Jesus is the greatest thing. Greater things are coming. See, we're only in chapter 1. And in three years of following Jesus around, Nathaniel definitely saw greater things. The most immediately immediate greater thing is the wedding in Cana in the next chapter when Jesus turned water into wine. But the greater things just keep coming in the gospel. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Jesus heals the sick. He uh, opens the eyes of the blind. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And the greatest, greater thing is the cross and resurrection. Sins forgiven, death defeated. Jesus is claiming this story for himself. He is saying that he is the new Bethel. He is the house of God, the one, the person in whom God lives and makes his dwelling. Jesus is saying he is the new stairway. Jesus is the one who unites heaven and earth, joining them as one, removing the barrier, the sin that kept heaven and earth separate. Jesus joins them back together, removing our sin. And Nathaniel is there through all the greater things, from the first to the last. Because what's interesting about Nathaniel is that he shows up in chapter 1 as he meets Jesus, and he's with Jesus. But then Nathaniel also shows up in chapter 21, the very last chapter of this gospel, when they are fishing in Galilee after Jesus' resurrection. He sees the miraculous catch of 153 fish, and Jesus is there on the beach. He meets the resurrected Jesus. He's there for all the greater things. What would that be like to see them as an eyewitness? All the things from first to last in Jesus' ministry. Surely, Nathaniel's expectations were too low. Surely, when we come to Jesus, Jesus will raise our expectations beyond anything we could ask or imagine. When people come to Jesus, they find that he is so much more than they ever realized. Now, every year that I've been at this church, I've seen God lead people to our fellowship, to this body of believers. And so often I see that he did so with a purpose, that God had a purpose when he brings people into closer relationship with him. He had more for them. So often people who have come to this church over the years that I've seen this, this place, they've come having um, gone through some struggle and then found healing here as they got to know Jesus more. Or they came and then soon after they came to this church, went through some kind of a struggle. And God was with them through it, through the care of his people. That's happened every year I've been here because there is more that people find in God's grace in Jesus Christ as he leads and guides us together. Jesus is so much more engaging our minds, reaching deep in our hearts, changing our lives, giving us hope. Our faith is in Jesus of Nazareth, the one who will never let us down. Let's thank him for this grace. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, who is so much more. That Jesus is so much more than we will ever come to know in this world. But even as every day we are amazed by new things that we receive and that we find out about, and that we learn of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're so thankful for Jesus and pray that not only would we we'd meet him here in worship this morning, but that we would continue to walk with Jesus every day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Every day would be a day with Jesus and that you show us new things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Zach. Would you, uh, brothers and sisters, please stand? And we are going to sing a song that um, here in this church and Perhaps either churches like it. It's, uh, we find it in our hymnal. It's called God Himself is With Us. And if you look at the upper 
uh, corner of the, the page of this hymnal. I mean, this is one of the songs that we often use for the opening of, of worship. It is a, it's a beautiful song for a call to worship. And here we are, having heard the word of God, going out into the world to um, apply it and to, uh, to live it and to share it. And uh, we remember that we are sent out um, in the same spirit of, of worship that we, that we come and gather in. And so we remember that as we go out into our world this week and all the things that we do, that God himself is with us in the person and work, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant to you his peace. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing the doxology together two times through.
Amen. You are dismissed.